Welcome to this tutorial on population and sample. This is Dr. Amanda Rockinson Zapke, and we're going to talk about population and sample in light of writing a participant section of a quantitative research proposal or plan. We're going to talk about the necessary elements of a participant section for a quantitative proposal or plan. When you're writing your participant section, there are a few things that you need to include, and that's what we're going to discuss. You need to talk about the characteristics of your sample, of your population, of your accessible population, and your sampling frame. You need to talk about your sampling design. Are you going to use a single stage or a multiple stage design? And then what type of sampling within that design are you going to use? And what specific methods are you going to use? You need to talk about the needed sample size for both your chosen research design and your analysis. And you need to talk about the type of assignment you're going to use if you're going to do a group comparison study or do an intervention. You need to talk about the assignment or an alternative. So in this tutorial, we're going to talk about all of these different things and we're going to spend some time defining them, looking at examples so that by the end of this tutorial, you will hopefully be ready to write the participant section of your quantitative research proposal or plan. Let's start by reviewing the definitions of a few terms that are very important. You've probably heard these terms before, but it's always good to have a review. First of all, there's the term sample. Remember, the sample is the group of individuals that you plan to observe during your research. Usually your sample comes from your sampling frame or accessible population. The sampling frame refers to the list of the sampling entities, that's the individuals, organizations, or other planned unit of analysis. It's a list and from which basically your potential participants are drawn. The ac accessible population then is the population to whom you have access and can generalize to if you're randomly sampling from it. And finally, there's this idea of population. That's the larger group that you would like to generalize to. Now, these terms and these definitions are somewhat abstract, so let's put it in context, in the context of a case study of a doctoral student named Samantha. Let's say Samantha is interested in the population of online graduate students. Since it's not possible to study the entire population of online graduate students internationally or even in the United States, she has to consider who is accessible to her. And she needs to draw a sample of individuals from this access accessible population. This will be, her accessible population will probably be, let's say, a group of online graduate students at the university where she works. She has access to these students. She can sample them, she can um, implement a treatment with them, so that's her accessible population. Her sampling frame will be the potential list of students, so those, those students who make it on a list of who she plans to contact to participate in her study. That's her sampling frame. And then finally, her sample are those online graduate students who participate in her study. Now that you have a better understanding of these terms, let's talk about what do you include in your proposed research plan or in your research proposal in terms of the population, accessible population, sampling frame, and sample. Well, in your proposed research plan, you want to describe the population. This includes, but isn't limited to, a discussion about their sex makeup, their age, their ethnicity, and other unique characteristics. You then want to talk about your accessible population and sampling frame in light of the population. So what do you know about their sex, ethnicity, and other unique characteristics? You also then want to list the demographic or the inf demographic information and other information you're going to collect from your sample so that in your final report you can discuss, for example, the percentages of males versus females, the ethnic makeup, and you can state whether or not this reflects what is known about the population or doesn't reflect it. So let's talk about this in terms of an example. Again, these are some, this is, we're talking somewhat abstractly, and it's always easier when you can 
take the abstract and make it concrete. And the best way to do this is a case study. So let's say that there is a researcher who wants to study international school administrators. That's the population. And he or she has access, let's say he, he has access to international school principals from two international school organizations. This is his accessible population. So he's going to talk about the what he knows in general from the literature about the international school administration population. And then he's going to talk about what he knows about his accessible population. So information he can gather from these two organizations. He then is going, he's then going to talk about or may state that he's going to take a volunteer sample of the international school leaders from the lists that are provided to him by these two organizations. And let's say these two organizations are the International Service Schools and American Sponsored Overseas Schools. His, that list then, remember, is his sampling frame and he's going to describe how many people are or how many individuals are on that list. He's going to describe what he knows about their ethnic makeup, about their sex, about any other unique characteristics. He's also going to describe what he knows about the administrative roles um, from these two organizations. For example, he may say, you know, an administrator is defined as someone who's a principal, a vice principal, a head of a department, or other terms. And he's going to list and describe their responsibilities. Again, describing the unique characteristics of his accessible population and his sampling frame. And then finally, what he's going to talk about the information, the demographic information, the unique characteristics he's going to collect from his sample. So this, for example, may be, you know, sex. It may be the type of role that they hold, the number of hours a week that they, uh, they participate in their role, and those types of things. So he's going to discuss in detail the information he's going to collect from a sample. Now, um, hopefully now you understand what in is included or have a general idea of what's included in a proposal, a research proposal, um, in terms of population accessible, population sampling frame and sample. I want to make one more note here, something that I find useful. When I'm creating demographic survey questions to collect data from my sample, sometimes I can obviously get that archivally, but oftentimes I have to develop some type of survey with questions to gain information about the demographics and unique characteristics of my sample. And something that I find useful is the National Opinion Research Center General Social Survey. I'll say that again, the National Opinion Research Center General social uh, survey. This is a survey that collects demographic information and other useful information and I often find it helpful to look at this survey as I'm wording demographic questions for a demographic survey that I'm going to put together for research. Now we're just getting started on what needs to be included in a participant section for a proposal or research plan. Uh, we talked to, and we're just getting started having defined and talked about what you include for a population, accessible population, your sample and sampling frame. We're now going to move on to sampling design. So in a participant section, you need to include sampling design. Now there are two main sampling designs, a single stage and a multiple stage. A single stage design it really consists of one stage. That is, it may be used when a researcher has access to a list of names within a population or accessible population and plans to sample directly from that list. Again, let's put this in context to make it more concrete. Let's say, for example, a researcher wants to understand the continuing education needs of licensed professional counselors in the Commonwealth of Virginia and she wants to sample the entire population. So she obtains a list of all the licensed counselors in the Commonwealth of Virginia from the Virginia Board of Counseling. She then randomly chooses or selects a hundred counselors, contacts those counselors, and requests that each of them complete a survey. She uses a single stage sampling design. Now, there's also a multiple stage sampling design, and this refers to sampling that's carried out, obviously, in multiple stages, usually larger populations subdivided into small, smaller populations or targeted groupings. 
Again, let's take let's look at an example to make this idea a little bit more concrete. Let's say, for example, a researcher wants to survey online students attending KCREP accredited graduate counseling programs in order to better, better understand how they develop skills and knowledge via their online courses that they find necessary for their profession. In the first stage of sampling, the researcher goes and obtains a list of all the KCREP accredited online programs from the KCREP accrediting body. He then randomly selects five schools from each of the four regions in the U.S. He contacts those schools then and obtains a list of students from each of those schools. So in the second stage of sampling, the researcher randomly selects 20 students from each school list. He contacts each of these students and requests that they complete a survey. So he did sampling in two stages. First, he contacted the accrediting board to get a list, and then he contacted specific universities and colleges to get a list. And so this is a multiple stage sampling. Um, you can, you can uh, use multiple different types of sampling at each of the stages, but your sampling design, but you need to talk about in your participants section, your sampling design. Are you going to use a one-stage design or are you going to do a two-stage design? Now we're going to talk about once you've chosen what type of design or what um, sampling design you're going to use, we're going to talk about the different sampling methods and techniques that you can use when you use either a one-stage or multiple-stage design. Now, there are two types of sampling. So there are the designs, the single and multiple stage, and then now we're moving on to talking about the two types of sampling that you as a researcher can use, and that's random sampling and non-random sampling. Let's talk about random sampling first. Random sampling is when each individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected to participate in the study. If participants are randomly selected, then biases do not systematically alter the sample, and it's feasible to say that the sample is like the population, and therefore the results obtained from the sample during the study can be generalized to that population. This is truly the most desirable type of sampling. However, it's often a very expensive and not very possible type of sampling, but it is the most desirable. Now, in random sampling, there are three different types of random sampling that are commonly used. There are more than three, but there are three that are commonly, commonly used. And that's simple random sampling, stratified random sampling, and clustered sampling. So we have random sampling. Then the other, and then we have types or methods within that random type of sampling. Then we have non-random sampling. And non-random sampling is probably the most commonly used, um, especially when you're doing educational or social science research. And non-random sampling is when you do not have control over who can be included in your sample, and you use, a, you use the population that is basically convenient for you. Now the negative or the downfall of this type of sampling is that not having randomness reduces or limits the generalizability of your actual results. Um, again, there are multiple types of non-random sampling, but the two that, uh, and we're going to talk about two of those that are often used. So now let's look at the different types of random and non-random sampling that researchers usually use. We're first going to talk about the three specific types of random sampling. First of all, there is simple random sampling. This is when a sample um, is taken from the entire population and everyone within that population has an equal chance to be selected. Let's say, for example, if a researcher's population is second grade students in one school district. And the researcher picks the name or picks a hundred random participants from the list of the entire second grade student body within that district. Um, and let and that random sampling or that random picking of a hundred can usually take place using some type of random number software or random number table. You can look more into this um, in the majority of introductory quantitative research texts. They talk about 
random number tables and um, so different software. So there's simple random sampling. There's then stratified random sampling. And this is when individuals are divided into strata or groups. For example, male versus female. And then the individuals are randomly selected from each of those strata. So for example, if, you're, if the researcher is looking at a population of second grade students within a district, he or she divides them into males and females, and then randomly selects 50 um, students or 50 participants that are male and 50 participants that are female, that researcher used a stratified random sample. And this, in a stratified random sample may be useful, let's say, if the researcher was studying math achievement, and we know that uh, sex can affect math achievement, and so the researcher wants to make sure that there's an equal number of uh, males and females in the sample. Finally, we have cluster random sampling, and this is when um, groups already exist, and the groups are randomly selected. So we're talking about groups. For, so for example, a researcher could randomly select second grade classes in a district and this, uh, students within those classes become part of, the, part of the research. So these are the three types of random sampling that a researcher may use if they decide to use random sampling um, in their sampling design. So they can use random sampling in a one-stage design. They can also use it in a multiple-stage design. And in a multiple-stage design, I'll say this, they can use random sampling and then non-random sampling, or non-random sampling and then random sampling. So we're talking about the types of sampling uh, that a researcher can use once they've chosen a sampling design. So let's, let's now move on to non-random sampling which is most often used. Here you can see there are two primary types of non-random sampling. There's purposive sampling, which is a sample that's selected based on characteristics needed in order to meet the objective of the study. This is really a type of sampling often used in qualitative rather than quantitative research designs. And drawing really from qualitative text, um, purposive sampling can be understood as information rich, an information really rich method of sampling. Um, again, individuals are chosen because they meet a specific criteria or they've experienced a certain phenomenon. And the researcher wants to study that. Within purposive sampling, there are then different techniques that a researcher can use. And those techniques include everything from maximum variation to typical case sampling to snowball sampling. And because these are primarily qualitative, I'm not going to talk about these necessarily in depth here, but just know that they exist. And uh, Patton talks about these different types of sampling, Moustakis, Glasser and Strauss, Cresswall. So if you're interested in this type of sampling for a, mainly a qualitative study, I encourage you to look at those texts. However, the main non-random sampling that a quantitative researcher uses is convenient sampling. And convenient sampling um, is basically the researcher samples a group of participants that are accessible or convenient to them. So for looking back at the example of Samantha, Samantha uses online graduate students from the university that she's employed at because that pot that that or those individuals are accessible or convenient to her. A convenient sample can also be a sample of volunteers. So volunteers are considered a convenient sample. So again, let's go back and look at, let's just sort of take a moment and review here what, what thus far needs to be in a participant section of a proposal or research plan. First of all, you're going to talk about, as we, as we said, this uh, population, the accessible population, the, sample, the sampling frame, and the sample. You're then going to identify what type of sampling design are you going to use. Are you going to sample in one stage or multiple stages? And then within each stage, you're going to talk about whether or not you're going to use random sampling or non-random sampling, 
and talk about the specific method. So for example, you may use a single uh, design and you may choose to use a convenient sample. Now, in addition to these elements, you also need to talk about the sample size. Remember in a quantitative research plan, it's desirable to have a large sample size. But what is meant by large? Well, when I say large, I mean a sample size large enough to ensure that your research is valid and that you have sufficient statistical power to make conclusions from your results. Let's talk about first research convention. So your sample size, your proposed sample size, or your actual sample size needs to meet research conventions. So for example, research text writers suggest a minimum of 30 participants for a causal comparative study. Um, for Cresswell, Gogol, and Borg, and many others recommend a minimum of 15 for experimental studies. So you need to look at the research text and find out what is the research convention. And you need to talk about in a proposal or research plan what that research convention is and how you plan or will meet or do meet that research convention. In addition to research convention, there's statistical convention that determines your sample size. Now, unfortunately, with many sample size recommendations from research texts, the average power of the null hypothesis significance testing in these typical studies is about 0.4 or 0.6. Now, you may go, well, what's the problem with that? Well, you're, what you really are looking for is a statistical power of 0.8. So you can say with 80% certainty that your conclusions are correct. And so you need to consider what is research convention. You also need to consider what is statistical convention. And you determine the sample size um, from, from a formula that can be found in most analysis text. So in your participant section, you're going to talk about, in a, in specifically in a proposal, you're going to talk about what is your needed sample size for your chosen research design and your analysis. Um, again, the literature suggests what a good sample size is for a chosen research design, and then you can calculate using sample size and effect size what you need for a strong, strong statistical power. And again, this is found in most analysis text. Um, SPSS will do it for you. GPower will do it for you. Some statistical texts actually have formulas for specific uh, specific designs and specific analyses. So for example, if you're looking at like a multiple regression, I think it's Warner, don't quote me on this, I think it's Warner that says you have to have 108, or it might be Tabaknik and Fidel, 108 plus the number of variables that you're studying. So you can look in analysis text for specific information. But in addition to all the other elements that we've talked about, you need to talk about sample size in a research proposal. So finally, in a participant section, you need to talk about random assignment or group equivalence if you're going to do a group comparison study or implement some type of intervention. So let's talk a little bit about this. Let's start with random assignment. Remember, random assignment is the assignment of participants to a group on a random basis. That means you have a list or a sampling, or you have a list of participants and you randomly assign them to either the treatment or control group. And it's random, so every individual on that list, on that participant list, has equal opportunity to be either part of a treatment or a control group, or intervention or non-intervention group. And this really ensures that participants in different groups are reasonably comparable. It eliminates the possibility of systematic differences. So you can really say that the differences that you see in the results of your study are due to the treatment or the intervention. So if you plan to randomly assign to treatment or control, intervention or non-intervention, or multiple treatments, you need to talk about this and talk about how it will be done. Now, as, we've as, we talk, uh, as we talk about re different research designs and it's ideal to randomly assign but not always possible, um, there are alternatives to random assignment 
that ensures equivalence or helps control for the selection threat to validity. Um, and usually these alternatives are used whenever you're conducting a quasi-experimental design, pre-experimental design, or causal comparative design. And these alternatives are matching, the use of homogeneous groups, or an analysis of covariance in which you use a pretest or you do some type of statistical control. So in the participant section, you need to talk, a if you're doing a group comparison, you need to talk about, are you going to use random assignment or one of these alternatives? So now we've talked about all the different elements that you need to include in your participant section of a research proposal or research plan. And specifically, we've really focused on a quantitative research proposal or plan. We talked about you need to include characteristics and a description of your population, of your sample, of your sampling frame, um, and accessible population. You need to include the sampling design and talk about within that design, remember it's either a multiple or single design, you need to talk about the type of sampling methods or procedures you're going to use. Are you going to use random or non-random and what specifically are you, go what specific method are you going to use? You need to talk about sample size. You need to talk about what is expected for research convention as well as the statistical analysis that you chose. And then finally, if you're going to do a group comparison, you need to talk about the type of assignment that you're going to use or you need to talk about the alternatives that you're going to use to ensure group equivalence. So now you should be ready to go ahead and write the participant section of your proposed research plan.